and um, nice to have Leone with us too. That's pretty good. And um, very good evening, everybody. Now, I want to start with perhaps an unfortunate uh, starting point. What was our conference theme? It was to look up, to look out, and to look forward. And that's because Christ's coming is very near. And that means for us personal redemption. Luke 21, 28 says that when we see these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up our heads because our redemption draws near. Now, how do we know that our redemption draws near? Answer, it is the signs of the times. Now, that we're able to understand these is an immense privilege and I'd like us please to come in the first place to Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Perhaps a slightly different context, but a relevant point nonetheless. So, so Amos, uh, in, in early part of chapter 3, tells Israel that God, they're the only family that God has known, so I'll punish you. And so the prophet prophesies. And then he says in verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Now, they are secrets. They continue to be secrets. But for those who understand the word of God, then God has revealed his secrets. And for us, that really is an immense privilege. Now, clearly, the predominant sign of God's handiwork is Israel. So much is talked about Israel in the scripture because Israel are the people of God. Now, what we need to understand is that there are other signs of God's working. God works in other nations too. And our hymn 239 talks about God unseen, yet ever near. So that raises a question. How is it that certain nations feature in Bible prophecy and other nations, probably greater, do not? And I think the answer can be summarised in this way. Where a nation or a group of nations interacts with God's people, either Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, or the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, then those nations become the subject of prophecy. Now, the point that we want to make tonight is that a united Europe is a particular sign of the return of the Lord Jesus. It's not the only sign, of course, but it's a particular sign. And the unification of Europe has expanded under two headings. The formation of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, and the European Union. And we'll have some very brief comments about Brexit and its impact. So, as we said, we consider the unification of Europe under two headings. Firstly, that of NATO, and secondly, of the European Union and its predecessors. We claim that the unification of Europe is a particular feature of Revelation 17. So we need to grasp what that passage is talking about. Let's first note this point, that Revelation 17 is given against the background of the seven last plagues. So if we have a look at chapter 15 and verse 1, we read there that John saw another sign in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So there's a statement of these last plagues, these final plagues, which complete the wrath of God. Now, 
chapter 16, verse 1, instructs those angels, those seven angels, to go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So when the angels had the plagues, and, and we must understand that in symbolic terms, those plagues, the, the, that, that liquid plague, sat in a bowl. And the bowl is are going to be poured out as we have it recounted for us in chapter 16. And then in chapter 17, verse 1, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, that is the seven last plagues. So these chapters here deal with the run-up to the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Now, additional to that, these chapters 17 and 18 discuss the, the fate of a city called Babylon the Great. So chapter 17, verse 5, refers to Babylon the Great, and chapter 18, verse 2, says that Babylon the Great is, is fallen, and so on and so forth. And we say, well, okay, that, that's not very helpful because the, the, the physical city of Babylon disappeared quite some centuries ago. In fact, it was only discovered almost by accident in the 19th century. So what is this Babylon that it's referring to? Well, we have to understand that Revelation is a book of symbol and Babylon is used in a symbolic or representative sense. So the destruction of Babylon in mentioned in chapter 17 and 18 leads on in chapter 19 to the establishment of God's reign on earth in his kingdom. So then, Revelation 17 talks about a woman named Babylon on a scarlet-coloured beast at a time just preceding the kingdom of God. Now, one of the nice things about the internet these days is you can get some pretty interesting pictures. There's one artist's representation of a woman on a scarlet coloured beast. Looks quite graphic. And then we have another one there. Now, that looks pretty close to real, either of those pictures, so that's okay. Now then, how do we know that Revelation 17 is talking about a united Europe? The good thing about Revelation 17 is that it gives us a number of points of explanation, which is quite remarkable because some of those points of explanation are a little lacking in other parts of Revelation. So, for example, let's have a look at verse 18 of chapter 17. It says, The woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, the Apostle John received the revelation according to the best evidence available in AD 96. At that time, the Roman Empire was supreme and there was a saying, all roads lead to Rome. So the great city that reigns over the kings of the earth is none other but Rome. Now the woman sits upon many waters that represents peoples, multitudes and nations and tongues. And the Apostle John would understand that to mean the various peoples and multitudes which together made up the Roman Empire. Of course Rome was dominant, but Rome had this unusual policy that it... That it it exported its military, but it also exported its system of law and government and engineering and architecture and so forth. And so you could travel from one end of the Roman Empire to the other and you'd come across cities and you'd say, wow, looks like I'm in Rome because they were built to a similar style. Now, John is also told in verse 9 of chapter 17 of Revelation 17, that the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sits. 
So we've already identified the city as Rome, and furthermore, it's a city built on seven hills or seven mountains. So we'll have a look at that in just a minute. And the beast with ten horns hearkens back to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. To, and, and verse seven. So from Daniel, it's clear that the fourth beast map paralleling the fourth metal, the metal of iron, the legs of iron, is that fourth great world empire, which is the Roman Empire. So we have many points of identification which in the days of John point to the Roman Empire. Now, this is a picture of Rome at a particular time where, where it was surrounded by a wall called the Servian Wall, and that enclosed the ancient city. And you notice there that there are seven hills picked out. The city, of course, has expanded far more greatly. To the, le to the top left there, we see a familiar name, Vatican. And that's doubtless where Vatican City is currently located. But there it is. The ancient city of Rome is there outlined on the Servian Wall built on seven hills. Now, the ten horns, which answer to the ten toes and the t of Daniel 2 and the ten horns of Daniel chapter 7, we are told here are, 12, are ten kings. Verse 12 tells us that. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings. They have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Now, um, we'll jump a little bit into history. At the time that John wrote, yes, these ten horns, these ten kings, these ten kingdoms did not exist. That came much, much later on have a little bit more to say about that later. What we are told is that they will be there having power as kings with the beast and here's the critical piece of information. Verse 13. These are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. In other words, these kingdoms will voluntarily surrender part of their sovereignty, part of their authority to the beast. Again in verse 17, God has put it into their hearts to fulfil his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Now, it's these two verses that emphasise for us the significance of what today we would probably take for granted a united Europe. And they will be there at the time to war against Christ, who will defeat them. Now, John's told some other information, which we're going to skip over at the moment, but we want to move on now to the fact of Europe in AD 400. And you can see a huge swathe of pink embracing Italy, Portugal, Spain, France and the Low Countries and that was all part of the Roman Empire. The, the Roman Empire united that area of the world and significantly that was new area embraced within the kingdoms of men. Up until the Roman Empire, the bits to the right of the orange bit in the middle that was the extent of the Greek and Persian and, and other empires that ruled before. They didn't go much further west than that orange bit, which, by the way, is called Illyricum. Illyricum's the great dividing line between the western and eastern parts of the old Roman Empire. So that was Rome, AD 400. Now, by the time we come 200 years on, 
barbarians have overrun the eastern part, the, the western part, beg your pardon, of the Roman Empire, and they, as you can see there by the different colourings and different shadings, they have formed a lot of kingdoms, and they're constantly at war and they're fighting each other, trying to get the best of each other. So here is the western part of the Roman Empire and it's fallen into a lot of this hodgepodge of warring states. The foundations of the ten horns or the ten kingdoms that Revelation 17 talks about. Now, people longed for the unity of the old Roman Empire and some more ambitious people decided to have a go at it. Here is a map of Europe in AD 800. Now, the area of Spain and Portugal are now subject to the Muslim invaders, the, the Moors, but there's this huge area encompassing France and central and parts of, of modern Germany, as well as the northern part of Italy, which was the kingdom of Charles the Great, or we know him better in history as Charlemagne. Now, by the time we come to AD 1100, there's further development in this attempt to unify Europe. You see this large orange blob in the centre and extending down into Italy. That became what was known in history as the Holy Roman Empire. And some wag wrote, it wasn't terribly holy, it certainly wasn't Roman, and it was more a hodgepodge of states rather than an empire. But there we go. So there's still this longing for the unity of the old Roman Empire. And, of course, pesky nations like France and, and, and Spain and so forth are wanting to do things under their own steam. And now, by the time we come to AD 1500, the nations of France, Spain and Portugal are fairly well defined. Central Europe the area that was part of the Holy Roman Empire has disintegrated into a patchwork of states, hence all the different colours. And Italy as a nation, well, it certainly didn't exist there. It was carved up between various warring powers. Now, Napoleon, a thousand years after Charles the Great, decided that he'd like to be Napoleon the Great. And so what we have is that France expands and pushes deep into the low countries of Europe and has a huge say in what goes on in Italy. And so by force, France decides to unite Europe under its own banner. And of course, that all came unstuck at the Battle of Waterloo. Now, not to be dismayed, one Adolf Hitler decided he'd have a go, and you might say he was somewhat more successful than Napoleon was. And so that is the extent of the Nazi regime over Europe during the height of, of, of during 1939, 1945. And um, there's a core territory, the dark blue there, the lighter blue were where the, um, uh, the uh, Wehrmacht pushed through and took lands and countries off the then Soviet Union and um, Italy was allied somewhat reluctantly perhaps to Germany. So Nazi Germany decided by force of arms to unify Europe and that all came terribly unstuck in 1945. So, that was essentially a 2,000-year snapshot of European history. Europe was essentially coherent under the Roman Empire till the barbarians established various states, as we've said, constantly at war, and there were two attempts to unify Europe by force. Now, just um, a little bit of a digression here. Hitler's regime often styled itself as the Third Reich. The Third Reich. So we asked, well, OK, what was the Second Reich? The Second Reich was the German Empire that lasted from 1871 
to 1918. All right, that's all cool. What's the First Reich? And the answer is the Empire of Charlemagne. That Charlemagne unified Europe some of the more ambitious people like Napoleon and Adolf Hitler decided they would try and emulate. And it all came unstuck. 2,000 years of history showed that Europe was constantly at war, unifications by force, culminating in the destructive outcomes of World War II. Now... After World War II, the Western powers got very, very nervous about the ambitions and designs of the Soviet Union after Joseph Stalin. And they persuaded Western European countries to form an alliance called the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, or NATO. Um, Lord Ismay was overheard to have said that NATO was designed to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. They were trying not to have a repeat of the Second World War. Now, West Germany joined NATO in 1955, and that led to the countries in Eastern Europe under the... Uh, 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 under Soviet influence to form their own union called the Warsaw Pact. So you then ended up with two great camps, that of Western Europe under NATO and communist influence Eastern Europe. NATO membership was static until 1990. And then, on the 3rd of October, 1990, the unthinkable happened. You see, in 1945, a conquered Germany was split between the four great powers, Britain, America, France, and the Soviet Union. Britain, America, and France, Persians were united into West Germany. The Soviet part remained East Germany. One of the peculiarities of the names of some of these regimes, the, the East German part was known as the German Democratic Republic, not too much democracy in East German, I, I can assure you. The reunification of Germany markedly changed the European landscape. We often forget that. We often forget that. The reunification of Germany had severe knock-on consequences. The Soviet Union dissolved and with it, along, uh, along with it, the Warsaw Pact. And as a result, NATO expanded its membership to Eastern European countries. France had withdrawn its forces from NATO in 1966, from the NATO command in 1966. But in 1995, it rejoined, it, it recommitted its armed forces to NATO. On the 29th of March 2004, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, former Soviet republics, Slovenia, a nation from the former Yugoslavia, Slovakia, part of Czechoslovakia, which dissolved in 1993, Bulgaria and Romania, former Soviet satellites, joined on the 29th of March 2004. Meaning that Europe has a united military structure from the Atlantic Ocean to the Russian border. Now, what we've got to realise is that in 1945, if you had said looking at the devastation of war. Europe will have a united military structure in 60 years' time. Um, people would probably have thought you were in need of hospitalisation. I now want to proceed to the next phase of our discussion.
one of the unifying forces was that of, as we said before, of NATO, the military alliance of Europe. Now, is that relevant? Well, we read Revelation 17 and verse 14, and we are told, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. The these of verse 14 refer both to the horns and the beast. And so we see the military campaign that has led now to a united Europe militarily. This is a, uh, that was Berlin in 1945, not a great place to be in. Sorry, just let me catch up with my notes. Thank you. Um, and that is a picture of the ruin and the devastation in southern Europe. Now, what was going to happen? As I said before, the Western powers were now becoming extremely nervous of Soviet Union designs on a ruined and shattered Europe. And so there was concocted a plan called the Marshall Plan, or officially the European Recovery Program. And this is a graph of the various countries that received aid from the Marshall Plan, or the European Recovery Program. And yes, it's true, Great Britain and I, uh, Great Britain received a very substantial aid package. France got a substantial aid package because of the devastation of its country. And even West Germany got substantial aid from the Marshall Plan. So then, with Europe in ruin at the end of World War II, the Marshall Plan was designed to help rebuild and cre recreate a stronger economic foundation for Europe. And the United States, of course, made available billions of dollars, maybe even trillions, for funding that. In 1952, the Marshall Plan ended. The economy of every participant state had surpassed pre-war levels. That's not bad. So from 1945 to 1952, Europe rebuilt, and at the end of 1952, the economic state of Europe was better than it had been in 1939. Europe experienced unprecedented economic growth over the next two decades, but Moves were afoot. Senior figures acutely conscious of the destructive forces that had torn Europe apart began moves, critical moves, to form some sort of united Europe. The first step in that process was the European coal and steel community and it was expressly designed to eliminate some of the causes of war between France and Germany. And it was the first stage of building a united Europe. It was first proposed in the 9th of May, 1950, and the Treaty of Paris on the 18th of May, 1951, saw France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands sign the Treaty of Paris. And its aim, as I said, was to create a common market for coal and steel. Now, that was seen to be relatively successful and so building on the European Coal and Steel Commission community there was proposed for Europe a customs unit. And whilst there were some people striving for political integration, nevertheless, those, 
those efforts stagnated, but there was immense progress on economic union. And finally, on the 25th of March on 1957, came the Treaty of Rome that established the European Economic Community, or we know it better as the Common Market. And the six nations that had signed the European Coal and Steel Community were the signatories to the European Economic Community or the Common Market. That Treaty of Paris also established another agency, the European Atomic Energy Community, or what was often referred to as Euratom, and that was its focus was on the de development of nuclear energy. Now, in 1965, there was a treaty, the Brussels Treaty, to merge the coal and steel community, the common market and Euratom, with a common executive. And all three are now folded up into a European community. Now, for some reason, things are not responding. Right, we got there. Good. Now, on the 3rd of May 1960, Denmark, Ireland, Norway and the United Kingdom applied to join those three communities that I mentioned earlier, Euratom, uh, European Coal and Steel Community and the European Economic Community or the Common Market. The veto of the French saw that lapse. But in 1967, there was another application, and this time the veto was lifted, and all those countries but Norway became members of that community. In 1962, the EC adopted common pricing levels for agricultural products. And in 1968, internal tariffs were removed on some products. In 1975, Greece applied to join and Greece became a member on the 1st of January 1981. Spain and Portugal applied and became members on the 1st of January 1986. Now, on the 17th and the 28th of February, the European foreign ministers signed an act called the Single European Act in Luxembourg and The Hague. The aim of that act was to reform institutions, to extend the power of the European Union, to foster increase foreign policy cooperation and the single market, which came into force on the 1st of July 1987. Now, if 1990 saw the reunification of Germany and East Germany enter NATO, it also meant that East Germany became part of the European community as well. And then came a most important treaty on the 1st of November 1993, the Maastricht Treaty. Now, what's that all about? The Maastricht Treaty was, was, was floated on the 7th of February 1992 and came into force on the 1st of November 1993. And its aim was the single European currency, which we know as the euro. And observers noted at that time that the progress that had happened so far meant that Europe was moving from purely an economic unit, union into a political union. In 2002, euro notes and coins replaced the national currency in 12 of the member states. 
And in 2004, the EU saw its largest enlargement to date, when Malta, Cyprus, Slovenia, etc., a whole raft of countries signed up to join the European Union. At the time that I prepared this, there were 27 member states and Europe was in a united military, economic and political union from the Atlantic Ocean to the borders of the Russian Federation, something which was unthinkable in 1945, quite unthinkable. That, <coughs> pardon me. That is a map of the European Community member states as at 2007. What the Roman Empire only partially did, what Charlemagne tried to do for a short period, what Napoleon tried to do for a short period, what Hitler tried to do for a short period, the European Union has effectively achieved. Britain, of course, has voted to leave the European Union. We'll have a little more to say about that later. Now, since then, of course, came the global financial crisis and with it, the European debt crisis. And it was opined by many that the European debt crisis would see the disintegration of European uni unity. Well, that was probably reasonable looking at that. Scripture tells us otherwise. The European debt crisis began late 2009 and directly caused by far too easy credit and there was a lot of confidence in governments replaying debts or securing new borrowings. The problem was this. Europe as a whole was basically OK, but there was a group of countries with the lovely acronym PIGS who had terrible finances. PIGS is an acronym for Portugal, Italy, Greece and Spain the countries that suffered greatly. Nevertheless, the terrible finances of the pigs meant that the whole of the European Union was affected by that, and the euro itself was becoming unstable. Greece was the most severely affected country, and in the latest round of negotiations, creditors needed to take a debt reduction of 50%. Greece, for its part, had to experience severe austerity measures before the rescue funds were released. That's a, perhaps a bit easier, a map of the European debt crisis. And the countries in dark green, they're okay. The countries in mid-green, France and some of the and Austria and, and uh, Czechoslovakia, um, they're kind of okay. The countries in light green, like um, like Spain and Poland, they're sort of very unstable. And the countries coloured brown, light brown and dark brown, their finances are in terrible shape. And you notice, of course, Greece is black. Its finances were really, really parlous, in terrible, terrible state. And so that was a problem, that the, there were some countries that were stable, had reasonably stable economies. Other countries were very, very challenged. And Greece, of course, well, was a basket case. Now then. What were the options made available? Well, recalcitrant countries could leave or be expelled from the euro, reverting to their original currencies. 
problem was the cost of borrowing, it was estimated, would devastate their economies even more so. Who was going to lend to Greece? Well, you probably want a 25% return on your money. And Greece borrowing and paying 25% on their money certainly wasn't going to work too well at all. Instead, within Europe, there was a growing opinion of the need for external consultants to come in and to impose financial discipline. And in practical terms, those countries would have to surrender some of their sovereign powers, which is exactly what Revelation 17 expects of us. Verses 12 and 13, which I'll read again. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. It's not that the beast overcomes them or conquers them. It is rather that they are prepared to surrender their authority. So we can argue that the European Union is represented in Revelation 17 by the beast, and the individual countries making up the European Union constitute the horn powers. Now, I'm, I do appreciate we've covered an immense amount of material. Um, we can make the, um, the PowerPoint show available if people want, to, want that. I want to talk very briefly about Britain and the European Union. What caused Britain to enter the EU in the first place? We mentioned before that the growth of the European economies was little short of spectacular after the World War. The British economy was seen as stagnating and Britain therefore applied to join the European Economic Community in 1963 and 1967. On both occasions, the then President de Gaulle of France vetoed that. But by this time, United Kingdom exports to the EEC exceeded those to Commonwealth countries and therefore EEC membership was seen as critical to Britain's economic fortunes. So, on the 1st of January 1973, Britain joined the EEC. The relationship has been constantly fraught. It has been constantly difficult. And there have been several times when terms of membership have been renegotiated. The latest renegotiation took place under Prime Minister David Cameron, who presented the renegotiated terms to the British public for remaining in the European Union. On the 23rd of June 2016, Britons went to a referendum and to the shock of many, the Leave vote won the day. Not by a very big margin, admittedly, but the Leave vote won the day. On the 29th of March 2017, Article 50 of the European Union Treaty was invoked. David Cameron resigned, Theresa May became Prime Minister and experienced repeated delays and frustration in trying to get terms for separation of the, from the EU. And I don't think it's an accident by any means that things seem to stagger on almost in a comical uh, comedy of errors, and then on the 24th of July 2019, the, the brash Boris Johnson became Prime Minister and got a deal approved by Westminster, and on the 9th of September 2019, there was royal assent to that. And on the 31st of January, the, e, the Great Britain left the EU. To be more precise, the 20, 31st of January at 2300 GMT. Now, very briefly, 
Yes, Britain was certainly part of the Roman Empire, but there was not the long-lasting legacy of Roman influence in Britain that occurred in over the rest of Europe. Britain was indeed subject to invaders, principally Germanic invaders, the Angles, the Saxons, the Vikings, the Jutes and the Danes, which imposed their law and their culture. It is perhaps interesting to note that if indeed Britain is the fulfilment of the merchants of Tarshish of Ezekiel 38, verse 13, it will be opposed to Gog's confederacy which embraces Europe. Boris Johnson recently gave a speech where he was supportive, highly supportive of Jews against a background, and this is important, a background of rising anti-Semitism within Europe. Now, shortly after Britain exited the European Union, the president of the EU, Jean-Claude Juncker, enunciated his vision for Europe. And it was noted by a number of commentators that Europe appeared even to have a new lease of life. With Britain gone, Britain being difficult and obstructionist and so on and so forth, suddenly the e EU seemed to get a new lease of life. Now, Jean, this is important. Jean-Claude Juncker has a vision for ever closer union in Europe on defence, asylum and foreign policy. He wants a bigger, more powerful European bloc under a new, directly elected EU president and a Eurozone finance minister would be appointed and every country in the EU would have to adopt the euro. What's he calling for? Closer political, economic and military integration, just as we expect from Revelation 17. Now, on March 2019, Mr Juncker called for a special summit of the remaining EU states in the remaining city of Sibiu to map out the future of the EU. He insisted that the wind is back in Europe's sails despite the deep divisions on Eurozone reform, migration quotas and democratic values. Now, that information came from the British Daily Telegraph of the 13th of September 2017. I actually picked up that information from a magazine, not content to get it from a magazine, I actually got that directly from the Daily Telegraph. The Daily Telegraph on the same issue, or a couple of days later, had this cartoon. There, Jean-Claude Juncker is dressed and styled as a Roman emperor, flanked by Roman soldiers bearing the EU flag. And there he is, loftily saying, I have a vision for the EU. What does all this mean? A lot of information. What does all this mean? Jesus gave us some prophecies about the sign of his coming, which supplemented Old Testament prophets and that of the New Testament apostles. We focus tonight on Revelation 17 in particular and seen that what Revelation 17 talks about is, if you like, the resurrection of the Roman Empire in the form of the European Union, which not only, of course, covers the territories of the old Roman Empire, but has pushed deeply into Eastern Europe, even to the borders of the Russian Federation. We live in exciting times, which tell us that Jesus' coming is very near. So we need to be ready for his coming and Harkening back to our opening words, 
we need to look up, look out and look forward because our redemption draws near.